morning and welcome to Peace Haven, where our mission is to glorify God by equipping local members to make global disciples. If this is your first time visiting with us, please stop by the welcome desk on your way out. We'd love to give you a free gift and speak to you for just a second. Good morning. You guys can go ahead and stand for worship. In 2 Samuel 22, we read a little bit about David's victory. It says, David spoke the words of the song to the Lord on the day of the Lord rescued him from the grasp of all his enemies and from the grasp of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock where I seek refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. You save me from violence. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. That is who our God is this morning, church. So let's remember that as we sing.
morning. Give him some praise. Sing 
Waymaker. You are Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, you are Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship. Children and the children. 
gracious to you. The Lord turned his face toward you and gave you peace. The Lord bless you. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Sing Amen. today. Somebody say amen. amen. I got to tell you, you can go ahead and be seated. I, I, I just want to say this, you know, every time that, you know, we sing certain songs around here, every time we sing that song, uh, man, it just does something to me. And, and I hope it does something for you today because uh, everybody in here, you're either going through something, you're going to be going through something, you're coming out of something. But I just want to say this to you today is that he is a, he's not just a way maker, he is the way maker. Amen. He's not just a way maker, he is the way maker. I want to read something to you today. This is from Betty Couch. And as you know, very sadly this week, you know, a lot can happen. A lot can happen in an hour. A whole lot of things can happen in a week. And, uh, you know, just last week Rodney was with us. It wasn't so long before that, 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 of course, Brother Don was with us. And just in two weeks' time, we've lost two warriors from our church. And that's great. When you take a Rodney Couch out of a church, or out of a world, and you take a Don Hemrick out of a world, uh, first of all, we need to be in prayer for their widows. Betty is here this morning. Betty, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Betty's the kind of person, if you get around her, she's going to encourage you. And Rodney was the same way, same way. And by the way, uh, we often talk about some saint of God that's gone on in past tense. Let's talk about him in present tense. Right now, Rodney's praising God more than he ever has before. He has seen him, yes, he's seen him face to face. And so we, we give praise and glory to God for that. I know that Don right now, Don right now is without sickness, but, but there's a void that's left. First and foremost, there's a void in these families, and secondly, there's a void in this church family. And so I just want to say today, let's be in prayer for Betty. Let's be in prayer, of course, uh, for Carolyn. I know that this is heavy on their heart, but I'll read this as Betty has, has written it to us. She said, I'd like to thank each of you for the cards, the visits, the calls, the food, the flowers, and most of all for the prayers lifted up for Rodney and me during Rodney's illness and passing. And Betty says, you are special people and I love each of you. And Betty, thank you so much. That's encouraging to us and we want to reach out and be an encouragement to you. We do have a birthday today. Debbie Wiles, stand up over there. Debbie uh, is uh, 39. And so Debbie, go ahead and stand up if you would, please. And everybody, if you would, just say happy birthday. All right, and you give her a hand as well. Uh, I have to tell you that um, uh, Debbie has been just a, a, a godsend to our church. And of course, you know, we, uh, we just are so grateful for her. She helps so much. And, and here, here's the thing about Debbie. She don't want me to say a word, but I, I do have to say this. Debbie goes above and beyond. You know, some people, you know, when they, when they punch out or whatever you want to say at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or whatever, you know, they're done for the day. And Debbie has so many times been so willing. And uh, even just this past week, um, uh, I'm not going to tell you what she did, but, but she and Stevie went above and beyond. And, uh, man, it just, uh, you know, just warms my heart, uh, you know, Debbie, for what you do. 
Uh, Steve's mean, but Debbie is a kind soul, and, no, and so I appreciate them. And I know I don't recognize everybody's birthday, but she's on our staff and does a great job, and so I wanted to do that today. Visitors, thank you all for being here. It's a privilege to have you. We don't take for granted that you've chosen to worship with, with us today. I hope you've been made to feel welcome. Some time ago, we stopped shaking hands just because of, of COVID, and we never have kind of gotten back into that. But I hope that you've been made to feel welcome today. We are privileged that you were here. We're in Jude. We are in Jude, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Jude, if you're not familiar with that uh, chapter, when that's what it is, it's a book, but it's just a chapter. It is the second to the last book of your entire Bible. So if you go to Revelation at the end, just come back a book, and you'll find the book of Jude. Our Bible says in verse 1, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, just uh, by way of review, remember, Jude is a bondservant of Jesus Christ, but he is the half-brother of Jesus He's the half-brother of Jesus, just like James, and he, he identifies himself as the brother of James in verse 1. He said, to those who are called, <clears throat> to those who are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, he says, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, this is where he identifies why he wrote this letter. He said, beloved, he said, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, as I've shared with you before in this series, uh, Jude wanted to write an encouraging book, a celebratory book, but the Holy Spirit changed him somewhere in the midst of this, and this is what he says. He says, I found it necessary to write to you instead, uh, to exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith, which was once of all delivered to the saints. He says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed, talking about creeping into the church, who long ago were marked out for all this condemnation ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness, a license to sin, so to speak, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, though. He said, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, that's the children of Israel, as Moses led them out, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. In other words, there were people that were among the people of, Egypt, uh, of Israel that came out of Egypt that did not believe. And you remember, they died in the wilderness over the next 40 years. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, in other words, the second rebellion, but left their own abode, God has reserved them in everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of that great day. And then he goes on and talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, the apostates of Sodom and Gomorrah, they reached an all-time high. And he says, the cities around them in similar manner to those having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, he said, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And so he gives us three illustrations. He talked about those that did not believe coming out of Egypt. He talked about those angels, part of the second rebellion of Genesis chapter 6. And then he talks about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, they are given to us in the Old Testament as an example of how not to live and to understand that if we do live that way, that there, is, there are dire circumstances and dire consequences. He says in verse 8, likewise also these dreamers King James calls them filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. He says, yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with Satan when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. As we talked about a couple of weeks, Michael himself even turned that over to God and said, that's out of my jurisdiction. But verse 10, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know. We talked about last week how that there are people out here who are calling us people who have committed intellectual suicide. In other words, you know, we don't understand science. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning. We don't understand astronomy. We don't understand physics, they say. And they say because of that, that we cannot really know what is true and what is real. And they are speaking about things that they don't know about because they don't know God. Paul clarifies to the church at Corinth, he says, some things have to be spiritually discerned. If you're a believer today, the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. He wants to teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance. He wants to illuminate your mind and illuminate your heart from the Word of God that you might understand things that are somewhat esoteric for, for believers. And really, they cannot be understood by the natural man or the people that Jude is describing here. He says they're talking about things they don't even know about and whatever they know naturally. In other words, what they can understand without the Holy Spirit of God, just like animals, in these things things they corrupt themselves then he pronounces a woe he says this and this is where we'll stop today in verse 11 he says woe to them we talked about last week they have gone after the way of Cain and he also says they have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Here in verse 11 of Jude's letter, we learned last week that the filthy dreamers had extended their apostasy. 
In other words, their rebellion against God to the way of Cain. And we discovered last week in our examination, in other words, uh, to the way of rebellion against God's plan for approaching Him. God has a specific plan as to how that we are supposed to approach Him, how we are supposed to please Him, how we are supposed to be saved. And Cain had his own idea. Do you remember back uh, in Genesis, how, how in Genesis 4, how that Abel, his brother, approached God through faith according to God's plan? Ladies and gentlemen, today that is the only way we can approach God. It, we approach God through faith and we approach God according to God's plan. By way of quick review, let's quickly revisit Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4. Look what our Bible says about Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, his brother, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. We don't know exactly how God did that. Maybe he sent fire from heaven. We don't know. But through it all, he being dead, he still speaks. What is he speaking? He is speaking to us, letting us know that even though he was murdered by his brother, that he was faithful to God and that his way was God's way. God's way was his way. Ever how you want to put it, he chose that way. He Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, just a couple of verses later, our Bible says this, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe, there's that faith, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so in conflict with how Cain came to God, Abel came to God through faith. Abel came to God God's way. He approached God according to the faith and what God had already revealed at that time. And the Bible even tells us, without faith, it is absolutely impossible to please God. For if you're going to come to God, you've got to believe that He is. In other words, He is the self-existent one. He is the self-sufficient one, believing that and that He is the one who rewards. He is the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. So Abel came to God with the right attitude. Abel came to God apparently with the right sacrifice. In contrast, Cain came with an attitude of self-sufficiency and his sacrifice was rejected. So ladies and gentlemen, since the very beginning, the essence of our relationship with God has been rooted in our faith and our trust in Him and in His Word alone. And that is it. Nothing added, nothing deleted. According to Hebrews eleven six, 6, we cannot please God any other way. And we must believe that He is. In other words, that He alone is self-existent. That He alone is self-sufficient. He is the sustainer of all that is in existence. He alone is the rewarder of those that diligently seek Him by faith. Now, I said all that to say this. The apostates of our day, what they do is they add to Scripture. They delete from Scripture. And they manipulate Scripture to say what they wanted to say to fit their own narrative and to, and to fit their own agenda. And I say to you today, that is a very dangerous place for a person to be, and it's a very dangerous place for a church to be. That is the way of Cain. So Jude introduces us to another aspect of apostasy that even extends beyond the way of Cain. He talks about it here in verse 11. We just read about it. We're going to talk about this one guy today. It's the error of a man named Balaam. Now we have to ask ourselves this question because many of you say, okay, uh, the way of Cain, I've heard of Cain, maybe you've heard of Balaam, but you don't know exactly who Balaam is. We've got to go all the way back to the book of Numbers to understand who Balaam is. Balaam is a very interesting biblical character, somewhat of an enigma actually. He is apparently a Gentile man. Our Bible tells us that he makes his home in Mesopotamia from whence God, you remember that was where God had called Abraham, Abraham out of, out of Ur of the Chaldees centuries before. But Balaam was a Gentile man. He was a soothsayer. He was known as a soothsayer, kind of like a circuit rider preacher used to be. Uh, Balaam was, a, a, I guess, a circuit soothsayer. He would travel the circuit, but he made his home there in Mesopotamia. But apparently he had made quite a name for himself in the spiritist circles of influence. Now, as we think about Balaam, he's a Gentile, he's from Mesopotamia, he's a soothsayer, not exactly the kind of man that you would figure to be used by God in the realm of prophecy, and yet that's exactly what happens here. Surprisingly, on occasion, God did this very thing. He would use somebody that wasn't necessarily, you know, of the norm, and he would use them, uh, you know, to bring knowledge and to bring wisdom to people. I don't know, uh, we're, we're going to see that he goes even further than Balaam on this, he goes even to another individual, and we'll talk about that person in just a minute. But the story of Balaam is found in Numbers 22 through 25, if you want to make a note of that. Now, that's a, those are a lot of chapters. 
So we're not going to cover every aspect of Balaam's life and every aspect of what happened there, but I'm just going to give you some highlights so that we can kind of understand what's going on. For the sake of time, we're not going to examine every detail of the story, but in order to understand Jude's point, and Jude is making a very valid point, we need to familiarize ourselves with certain highlights. Historically, let's just go back, okay, to Numbers. Historically, there was a king. His name was Balak. Now, don't mistake Balak with Balaam. Balak is the king of Moab. Now, like most other kings in Canaan, he had heard of how that God, in his power, had delivered his people from Egypt, as we alluded to a few minutes ago, including hearing about the parting of the Red Sea. What an amazing miracle. So Balak, like many of all the other kings, his heart melted in fear because he just assumed that the people of Israel, that after they had left Egypt and after the Red Sea had closed in on the Egyptians, he just assumed that Israel was coming after them. Now, there is absolutely no written evidence in Scripture that the people of Israel were gunning for Moab at this particular point in history. And so Balak is a bit paranoid, but he's convinced that Moses had him in his sights. And so in his fear, in his paranoia, Balak reaches out to Balaam. Now remember, Balak, king of Moab, he fears that Israel is coming after him. There's no evidence of it, but he's just paranoid. So he reaches out to Balaam. Balaam, remember, is this uh, well-known soothsayer. And what Balak does is Balak offers Balaam a huge amount of money, a huge payoff. And here's what he wants Balaam to do. He said, Balaam, you know, you've got this reputation, and so, you know, as a soothsayer, and so, you know, uh, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to pay you big time, and what I want you to do is I want you to pronounce a curse on Moses, and I want you to pronounce a curse on the Israelites. Now, here's the problem. Here's what Balak is, Balak is completely confused about. He thinks that Balaam, the soothsayer, actually has the power to alter future events. He thinks if Balaam says it, well, it's just going to happen. Now, he could not have been more mistaken. If God used a man or a woman, if God used a Jew or a Gentile to prophesy of future events, that individual's accuracy did not rest in their ability. It rests in God's omniscience and in God's omnipotence and in his sovereignty. Ladies and gentlemen, events do not occur because the prophets said it. Events occurred because God foresaw it and God predetermined it to happen. It's not about a prophet having power to change events. It's about a prophet hearing from God and speaking what God has put in his heart and in his mind. And so Balaam didn't have the authority to curse Moses. Balaam didn't have the the authority uh, to curse Israel. He couldn't curse. He could not bless. He was at the mercy of God's authority. And ladies and gentlemen, we all are. We are at God's mercy. So can I remind us all today of something that is forever true? Whatever God has settled in eternity, it cannot be altered in time. God exists outside the series of time, space, and energy. When God settles something in eternity, outside of time, space, and energy, whatever He has settled and whatever He has determined in eternity, time cannot alter. We cannot alter God's ultimate plan. God's sovereignty and God's providence have already predetermined what's going to happen. And ladies and gentlemen, we cannot change it. God exists out this series of time. He exists outside this series of space and matter. And His will cannot be thwarted by an evil king or by a rogue prophet. If God settles a matter in eternity, time can do nothing to change its course. And that's a, hey, that's a blessing, isn't it? Just in knowing that God has already paved the way. God already knows the end from the beginning. It would seem, though, that Balaam would have understood this, and most likely he did. As Balak comes to him, it would seem that he would know this, but the error of Balaam is, is, is of greed. It's the error of greed. Because what we're going to see in Balaam's heart and in his life is that he wanted the money more than he wanted the will of God. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Our Bible says this, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray. Now watch what Peter does. Peter does kind of a similar thing that Jude did. He identifies Balaam for what he really was. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Behar, who loved the wages of, what's that next word? Unrighteousness. Peter here, he refers to Balaam's error as one that seeks and loves the wages of unrighteousness. Now, as we follow the story of Balaam, we realize that he fell headlong into this pitfall of greed. Like so many apostate teachers, here's what Balaam liked. Balaam wished to use his ministry 
for God to acquire personal, personal gain. Now let me just say this. There's two kinds of ministers out there. Number one, there is the minister that is used by God to fulfill God's will. And then there is the minister that uses God to fulfill his own will. Some men are out there building a church for God. Some men are out there building their own kingdom and calling it a church. Here at Peace Saving Baptist Church, we are not a kingdom for John Bowman. We are a church and assembly that has been established for God. And the day that this preacher starts building this kingdom for himself is the day you better tell this preacher to take a hike. Because this preacher better just be being used by God to build his kingdom, not the preacher's kingdom. And it's a very dangerous place to be when a preacher gets to the point that he uses God to fulfill his agenda. No, he's supposed to be using, being used by God to fulfill God's agenda. And so let's keep that in mind. I want to stop here for a moment and clarify that ministry is never to be used as a money-making effort. No ministry should be used as a money-making effort. The church must never be a money-making mechanism. I was talking to somebody this past week, or maybe it was the week before last, but they were telling me about a church that had kind of folded, and they had just stopped existing because really nobody was coming. And then, I won't tell you who the individual was, but there was an individual in that church that sold the church to another church. And my first question is, okay, what did they do with the money? You're selling a church, and you cease to exist. You're selling the church to another church. Now, here, here's how this is supposed to happen. If you stop being a church, and you're going to have another church to come in, you give it to them. You say, well, why, why wouldn't you sell it? Well, here's my question. Who gets the money? The preacher? Better not. The people? Better not. They better not have it in their bank account. If they sold it and they had the money, it better have gone into another ministry because that money don't belong to them. That money belongs to God. We don't own a building. God owns this building. We don't own a church. God owns this church. God owns it all. And so my question, and they couldn't answer the question. They said, well, we don't know where the money went. I feel bad for the person who took God's money and put it in their own bank account. It's not their money. Ladies and gentlemen, it's God's money. It's God's money. The church must never be a money-making mechanism. The church has... Now, now, you know, sometimes people talk about the business of the church, and I just want to say this. Peace Saving, like most and many other churches, we have certain business aspects about us, and that is for the purposes of good stewardship and for the purposes of accountability. But Peace Haven is not a business. We are a body. The church is not a business. The church is identified throughout Scripture as being one thing. That is the body of Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. What happens when a body becomes a business? There's a word for it. When a body becomes a business, what is that? Prostitution. It's prostitution. If the body of Christ becomes a business, then what we are doing is we are prostituting the body of Christ to make money for other reasons. So I say to you today, Peace Saving Baptist Church, we are a body. We are not a business, and we're not going to turn this body into a business. We are a body identified with Christ. We are not a business. Apostate churches, here's what happens. When a church becomes apostate, and that is what Jude, Jude is warning about this. When a church becomes an apostate church, what happens is they begin to love money. Now, godly churches, what we do is we steward money, understanding that God owns it all. Our Bible is very clear, though, that the love of money is the root of all evil, right? 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 10. Our Bible says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is what Jude is warning about when he talks about the error of Balaam. There are people that have fallen in love with money. Now, now here's the big question. You'll notice what the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say, for money is the root of all evil. Does it? We've got to be careful, because every once in a while I hear people say, oh, well, money is the root of all evil. No. 
The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money. Hey, owning things is fine. And when I say that in the sense that God allows us ownership, and the reason I qualify it with that is this, we don't really own anything. Now, God allows us ownership, but what it really is is stewardship. God owns it, we steward it according to the will of God. But owning things, that's fine. But here's the problem. It's not about when we own things. It's about when things own us. There are things that we have allowed to own us. God has given us ownership, temporary ownership. You remember when Adam and Eve were created, he, what did he give Adam? He gave him dominion over the earth. Adam gave it up to Satan when he sinned, unfortunately. And now Satan is the prince of this world. Jesus is coming back as the last Adam, and he's bringing it back. But right now, we have temporary ownership of these clothes and of our cars and of our money and, 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 and of our health. We, we have temporary ownership of that. But here's the problem. Nothing wrong with owning things. Nothing wrong with owning money. There is something wrong with money owning us. Apostate leaders will do and say whatever they deem will yield the best personal return. That's the problem. Godly leaders will do just the opposite. They will say whatever God says no matter what it costs them. That's how, you, that's how you delineate between a godly leader and an apostate leader. An apostate leader will go any direction and say anything that he has to say to pad his own pocket and to fit his own agenda. A godly leader, on the other hand, he will say, thus saith the Lord, and he will say it no matter the personal benefit and no matter the personal consequences. Now, with that understanding, let's get a brief synopsis of Balaam's story. Here's Balaam. Balaam was the son of Behor, as we're told in Numbers 22. We just read that a while ago as well in our New Testament. He lived near the Euphrates River. He's over in Mesopotamia. He was highly regarded by the Moabites and the Midianites as a soothsayer and even a prophet, as we mentioned before, who could bless and curse with his words alone. Numbers 24, 2 through 9 tells us that. I don't have it for you. But the unlikelihoods of this story still leave me baffled. And here's why. How in the world does Balaam, who lives in Mesopotamia, how could he gain such notoriety from people hundreds of miles away? And even more baffling, that Balaam was a Gentile living among idolaters, and yet he claimed to have some knowledge of Jehovah God. Now, this, this would account, if he does have this knowledge, and apparently he does have some, this would account for Balak, the king, summoning Balaam, the soothsayer, and, and that I suppose Balak hoped Balaam could persuade or even manipulate Jehovah God to turn on his own people. I don't understand the logic of this from Balak's perspective. I don't understand the logic to some degree on Balaam's perspective perspective perhaps Balaam even Balak even assumed that Balaam could take power over Jehovah whatever be the case Balak seeked to generously employ Balaam to bring Israel to certain demise and so here's what Balak does Balak says okay you know I want I want to employ and I want to bring Balaam onto my staff so to speak and so he sends representatives to convince Balaam to come to them and to cooperate with Balak and he offered him a huge hefty sum of money a hefty payoff for doing so to Balaam now here's what happens God speaks to Balaam and God tells Balaam in Numbers 22 he told him he said don't you go with those elders of Moab he said do not go and don't you go with those elders of Midian. Don't you go and don't you go and curse Israel because they, are, they are, uh, are, are actually blessed and they are protected by me. So God tells Balaam, he said, this is not for you to do. You don't go. You listen to him. So Balaam refused to go with them. Well, in response to Balaam's refusal, Balak hears about it. And so Balak says, well, round two. In response to Balaam's refusal, Balak, King Balak, sent more riches and Balaam responded the exact same way. Numbers chapter 22, look at verse 18. Look what Balaam says. Then Balaam answered. Now this is the second time. Balak sends the first group. Balaam says, nope, I ain't doing it. God says, I can't do it. They send the second group. Balaam answered and he said to the servants of Balak, though Balak were to give me his house. He said, it doesn't matter what he offers. If he gives me his house. Now keep in mind, this is different from Abraham. You remember Abraham said, you know, you can offer me whatever. I don't want it. I trust God. Balaam's not really of that attitude. Balaam's attitude is not, you know, I, I can't do it and I won't do it. Balaam's attitude is just, I can't do it, but I'd like to do it. 
So he says this, he says, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. He's just saying to Balak, he's saying, send him word. I'd love to do it. I'd love to take your money, but I cannot because God will not allow me to do that. Now, before, again, we get too impressed with Balaam, we need to understand that Jude 11 portrays his heart to be one of apostasy. It's one of greed. He says things right from his mouth, but his heart loves the money. And it's interesting that God puts that heart to the test because that very night, here's what God does. And, and you know, if you're reading along at first, it doesn't make sense because God tells him you can't go. God tells him, you can't go. But then after Balaam responds and says, I can't go with you. It doesn't matter what you offer to me. I can't go. I can't do less or more. I believe God tests Balaam's heart and wants to see what he's going to do. So, but he tells Balaam, he says, you know what? You can go with the men if you want to. He said, however, when you get there, you can only say what I tell you to say. You cannot say any more, any less. You cannot do it. Well, amazingly, Balaam... And disturbingly, he jumps on his donkey and takes off the next morning with him. Now, that lets you know where Balaam's heart was. If Balaam's heart was in the right place, he would have said, Lord, I'm not going. There's no point in me going because when I go, I can't speak against you anyway. And I don't want to speak against you. But see, we're understanding Balaam's heart. Balaam didn't want to go because he knew he couldn't do anything. But then he goes hoping that maybe he can find himself a loophole. That's the mark of an apostate. He seeks the money above the truth. Peter warned church elders. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. Titus chapter 1, verse 11. Both Peter and Paul, they say this, do not do it for dishonest gain or filthy, it should say lucre, L-U-C-R-E. Do not do it for dishonest gain or for, as the old King James says, filthy lucre, but do it out of a love and a fidelity for Jesus Christ. Balaam loved the lucre more than he loved the Lord. Apparently, God was not happy with Balaam's decision to go. And we're going to see what happens here in a second. Remember I told you God used some unlikely people to speak his word. We're about to see somebody really unlikely. God's response to Balaam's decision to go with the men of Moab and Midian is made very clear in Numbers 22. Now, we're going to read a little bit of a lengthy passage here. I don't want you to stay with me, okay, because read it. It'll be worth your time, okay? So stay with me. Numbers chapter 22. Let's begin reading. Now, remember, here's what's happened. God has told Balaam, you can go. And I believe God was testing his heart because God is mad that he went. You know, sometimes God will say, okay, if you want to do that, you can. And he just kind of stands back and he says, okay, now what you're going to do? And then we go out and we do what we're not supposed to do, knowing we're not supposed to do it. And then God is a bit upset. So God's anger was aroused because Balaam went. And watch this. The angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against Balaam. And he was riding on his donkey, and two of his servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his his sword drawn in his hand. And watch what the donkey does. The donkey turns aside out of the way and went into the field. And watch what Balaam does. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards and with a, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he strikes her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. The story just gets funnier. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So <laughs> you kind of see this donkey. This donkey says, all right, I'm done. I ain't moving. I ain't moving. So Balaam's anger, watch this. Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and he said to Balaam, now, comical moment, God can use a donkey to speak his word, right? And I know many of you are saying, yeah, we're watching one this morning. Okay, don't say that. Don't say that. What have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand. He said, for I would kill you. So the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you've ridden ever since I became yours to this day? You know, I think the thing that's funny to me about this is Balaam is talking to this donkey and hadn't even realized it. I'm talking to a donkey. 
was I ever disposed to do this to you? He says, you know, all these years I've served you well, and I've never done this. And he said, no. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. Now Balaam is going to see what the donkey was seeing. The Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword in his hand, and he bowed his head, and he fell flat on his face, and the angel of the Lord said to him, now Balaam's going to get a talking to, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me, turned aside from me these three times. And if she had, watch what, watch what the Lord says here. If your donkey had not turned aside from me, surely I also have killed you by now and let her live. Now, it's a, listen, you're in a bad place when God is valuing your donkey above you. That's how bad this has gotten. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, he says, I will turn back. Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men. But here it is again. Only speak the word that I speak to you that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. Now, when Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab, which is on the border of Arnon, the boundary of the territory. Then Balak said to Balaam, did I not earnestly send to you calling for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? There's a good question. And Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. So Balaam went to Balak, and they came to Kirjoth Huzah. Then Balak offered oxen and sheep, and he sent some to Balaam and to the princes who were with him. Now, how about that? God uses a donkey to speak to one who is acting like a donkey. And God even says that at this point, he was prepared to kill the prophet and spare the animal. Now to quickly set the tone for the rest of the story, as we read, Balaam reiterated, he can only speak the words of God. Apparently, Balak misunderstood, but he's about to understand very clearly. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna abbreviate this and condense this succinctly, okay? I'm just gonna pile a bunch right into this statement. Four times, you can go back and read it in Numbers 22 through 25. Four times, Balak calls on Balaam to curse Israel. Four times, he calls on him, and four times, here's what happens with Balaam. Balaam speaks only the words that God put in his mouth, and instead of cursing Israel, he ends up blessing Israel. And that's exactly what was going on the whole time. Balaam had said from the very beginning, I can't curse them. I have to speak what God says. If God tells me to say this, I have to say this. If God says bless them, I have to bless them. I cannot curse them. So four times, Balak says, curse them. And four times, Balaam opens his mouth and instead of cursing, comes out blessing. After each oracle of Balaam that blessed Israel, Balak the king, he just got madder and madder and madder. He said, I brought you here to curse Israel, not bless them. I think this is funny. At one point, Balak said, don't bless them or curse them. Just keep your mouth shut and don't say anything. Because every time he would speak, Israel would be blessed. They'd be blessed four times. They were blessed. Finally, Balak said, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. But Balaam responded. He said, didn't I tell you? I could only speak the words that God put in my mouth. Numbers 23, 26, he said, I can't, that's all I can tell you. He said, you can give me all the riches that you want to, Numbers 24, 13, and that reality will not change. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is, if Balaam could have changed it, he would have. That's the problem. He says, I can't change it. But in his heart, he's saying, but I sure would like to. Now, I'll explain how we know this. How do you know that, Pastor John? Well, I'll explain in a minute how we know that to be true. But before I do that, I want to expose a common lie that apostates are telling people, and people are believing it today. And Some of you may have believed it, and I just want to warn you, do not believe this lie. In Numbers 24, after Balaam had blessed Israel the third time, Numbers 24, look at verses 10 and 11. Then Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam. Now watch what Balak says and see if this isn't common for what we're hearing today. Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam and he struck his hands together and Balak, King Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now there'll be one more time even after this, the fourth time. He says in verse 11, now therefore flee to your place. Here's the lie. 
I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor. Now that's a lie. Isn't that what this world is saying? This world is saying, well, you're following after God. We can honor you. We can honor you. We can lift you up. We can make you part of us. Isn't that what cancel culture is all about? You become like us and we'll protect you. But if you don't become like us, we will cancel you and your God and your belief system is keeping you from honor. Ladies and gentlemen, your belief system isn't keeping you from honor. Your belief system is facilitating honor. Because honor comes from above. Honor comes from God. But the big lie is this. This culture is so dark and they're so intimidating and they strike such fear into the hearts of Christians that even today Christians are buckling under and believing that lie that if they follow after God that this culture somehow will cancel them out. And I say this to you once again. If God be for us, it's a rhetorical question and the answer is nobody. Nobody. But here's what Balak does. He wants to strike fear in Balaam's heart. And he said, your God has kept you from honor. And Balak, or Balaam, he's not far behind. I believe he kind of believes it. The biggest lie ever told. By the way, isn't that the same lie that the serpent told Eve? Your God is keeping you from honor. He doesn't want you to be, to take that fruit because he knows then you'll be like him. You'll be able to understand good from evil. It's a big lie. Balak claimed to be the source. Here's the problem. Balak claims to be the source of Balaam's honor and provision, but he was not. And I say this to you today. This world is not your source. God is your source. This culture is not your source. This society is not your source. Welfare system is not your source. Joe Biden is not your source. The United States of America is not your source. God is your source. And so be reminded of that. Now you have no reason to fear. You remember Abraham? I mentioned Abraham a while ago. You remember Abraham, how he would not take the riches, the spoils of war from the king of Sodom? And then I think Abraham might have gotten a little afraid. I think we talked about this some time ago. In chapter 14, instead of him taking the spoils from the king of Sodom, he pays tithes to Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the priest of the El Elyon, the Most High God. And then in chapter 15, maybe a little fear started to enter into Abraham's heart because he realized he'd made an enemy with the king of Sodom, and the king of Sodom was a very powerful man. And God said, don't you be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your reward. I want to remind you today, no matter what happens out here, God is saying this to you. Don't you be afraid. I'm your shield. I'll protect you. I'm your reward. I'll provide for you. And there's not anybody in this world big enough to stop it cannot stop it psalm 75 6 and 7 our bible says this it says for exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south here it is god is the judge he puts one down he exalts another he's in charge of it all so don't be duped be like abraham in genesis 14 be that person that says i'm not taking anything from you because god is my shield and god is my reward sadly to end our record of balaam he sought after a loophole Because this whole time he's disgusted with God. This whole time he's frustrated because he wants what Balak is offering. And he does feel like that maybe God is keeping him from honor. He wanted those filthy riches so badly he shared an evil scheme with Balak as a strategy to exact the demise of Israel. Now keep in mind, God says you have to say what I tell you to say when Balak calls on you. You cannot curse them. You have to uh, bless them. In Numbers 25, we're not going to read it, but our Bible tells us in Numbers 25, the people of Israel are invited to join the people of Moab for a worship service, a worship experience for their false gods. Now, this would be an event. I just want to describe it to you very briefly. It would be an event of idolatry. It would be an event of open immorality. It would be a flagrant violation against God's covenant with Israel And yet many of the people of Israel actually went to Peor and they participated. And God had many of Israel's people executed in the process. I do have this for you. Numbers 24. Look at verses 4 and 5. This is the results. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people. The people of what? That went to this this celebration of the false gods in Moab. said, kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So 
So Moses said to Israel's judge, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to Baal, the false god of Peor. So God was serious about it. God was serious about it. I mentioned to you earlier, though, that Balaam could not speak against the words of God. But pay attention here. He found a loophole. He found a loophole in hopes of acquiring Balak's reward money. He still wants that money. He's that guy that says, okay, I can't do this, but I can do this because I want that money. Apparently, it was Balaam who suggested that Israel be invited to join in this idolatrous and this immoral festivity that honored Baal. So Balaam could not curse Israel, but he could convince Israel to curse themselves. On the outside, he could not curse them, but he's telling Balak, you know what? I think we might have a strategy. I can't curse them, but maybe we can put them in a position to where they curse themselves. In Numbers 31, Moses alluded to these Moabite women of Peor who had drawn these people in, but he also identifies who the culprit is. Look what our Bible says. Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women, talking about these Moabite women, caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Somebody help me. Balaam. Balaam. Moses identifies. Balaam's the one that advised this. Balaam's the one that got these women to do this. Balaam's the one that caused Balak to invite the people of Israel. I can't curse them. Four times, four oracles I have spoken and I have had to speak blessing. And now I want those riches. And so, hey, Balak, come here. Here's what we'll do. God is very strict on his people. And if you want them cursed, I can't curse them and God's not going to curse them, but they can curse themselves. And here's how they curse themselves. God had commanded for these people to obey his commandments. And when they step out of line, God brings them back. And he does it in a very, very dramatic way. And so if we can just get the people to come and to worship Baal, and if we could get the people to come and involve themselves in this immorality, then God himself will turn on his people. Balaam's got a great strategy. He wants those riches. And that's exactly what happens. Now, you say, well, what about Balaam? What happened to Balaam? Joshua 13, 22. See, God, God, did, God, God did judge Israel, but he judged Balaam too. The children of Israel, this is when Joshua, this is when the people are taking over the land of Canaan. And th this particular is the time when they're fighting for the land of Reuben. Watch what happens. The children of Israel also killed with the sword. Somebody help me. Those riches aren't doing him a whole lot of good now, is it? The son of Bayar, the soothsayer among those who were killed by them. So how are we going to tie this together today? What does all this mean? Well, the error of Balaam described by Jude 11 is, is that things owned him to the point that he thought that he could receive better from this world than receive from God. And I want to remind all of us today, God's reward is always better. Now, sometimes we have to wait a little longer. And sometimes God re, God's reward is heaven itself. But you keep in mind, there is nothing like looking up and seeing your Savior standing at the right hand of God with his arms wide open saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those who love his appearing. Who are the people that love his appearing? They are the people who have stood true to God. They have not allowed greed to warp their vision of what is truly meaningful, eternally speaking. So Balaam, Here's what he does. He says, well, you know, the reward of Balak is better than the reward of God. Even to the point of trying to outsmart and outwit God. Can I remind you of something? You can't outsmart God and you can't outwit him. You can't fool him and he's not trying to fool you. Balaam actually thought that he and Moab could defy God and get by with it. But as Jude has been very clear, apostates do not get by. Balaam paid dearly. Moab, as you read through Scripture, they paid dearly. And ladies and gentlemen, today, if we go after the way of Balaam, if we put greed before God's reward, we will 
pay dearly if we follow the error of Balaam. In the story of Balaam, we learn that God was not and is not for sale. But Balaam was for sale. Can I ask you a question today? Are you for sale? What's your price tag? You say, I'm going to follow God. But what's your price tag? What can you be offered? How about your life? That's the tough one, really, isn't it? But he that saves his life, he's going to what? He's going to lose it. So I say to you today, resolve in your heart that you have no price tag. And here's why. You've already been bought with the highest price that could ever be paid. I'm not my own. Paul says, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God's. He tells us, don't be for sale. The price for your soul has already been paid. There is no price higher than the cross of Jesus. And so today, whatever this world's offering, it's not enough. Whatever this culture offers, it's not enough. As believers, we must trust God for our needs. We must not fear being canceled. We must speak only what God speaks and never look to... Don't try to find a loophole so that you can get something that you know God doesn't want you to have. Because at that point, you're just going to be miserable. God is not keeping you from reward. God is sparing you the emptiness of greed. Because when a person becomes greedy, they become empty because they realize once they get what they have, it's really not that valuable at all. The best thing going is Jesus Christ, and there's nothing else like it. So you say, I want to own some things. Well, own some things according to how God wants us to own some things, but don't allow those things to own you. Today, don't have a price tag. Today, don't let those things own you. Today, realize you are owned by Jesus, and everything you got, He owns. And all we're doing is stewarding those things. As our deacons are coming, let's bow our heads. Our deacons are coming to prepare for our communion. Pastor Jared is coming. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, today, Lord, we are grateful for all of the things and all the goodness that you have given us. And Lord, today we ask you earnestly from our hearts, Lord, we ask that you would allow us, Lord, to see a glimpse of you and who you are and what you've done. Lord, as we take communion today, we would do this in remembrance of you. Lord, we pray your blessing over these elements, Lord, recognizing that they represent the broken body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. Lord, as we partake, we're identifying with the broken body that paid the price for our sin. The blood that was shed for our sin. So God, we love you today. We're grateful to be owned by you. We're grateful to have a price, the highest price that ever paid for our sin. And this we do today in remembrance of you. Would you stand with us? If you're able-bodied and you're a born-again believer, now this is important. This is important. If you're a born-again, baptized believer today, this is for you. Now you may be here today and say, Pastor John, I'm I'm not a believer. I'm not saved. Then don't partake. This is for born-again, baptized believers. You know, you say, well, I'm not a member of this church. Well, we, we practice close communion, not closed communion. You're welcome to practice with us today. If you're able-bodied, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to come and take the elements and then to go back to your seats and wait for further instruction as we go to our worship time. If you're not able-bodied, just stay in your seat and hold your hand up. We have deacons that will bring that to you in your seat. Let's do this. Begin coming forward. Go ahead and take the elements and return back to your seat. Those of you who, again, aren't able-bodied, please stay in your seat. Just raise your hand. We'll bring it to you.
continues to play. Um, what we want to do is we want to take time to remember the blood of Christ that was shed for us and his body that was broken and the elements that you hold in your hand, um, the juice that's in the cup and uh, the bread that's there uh, in your palm. I want you to take just the next few moments 
And before we partake of it, we want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And we're going to read it all at one time. And when, we're comp- when we have finished reading that text, I want to take just a few moments where each person can just pray individually over these elements that are in your hand and really think about what Christ has done for you. Remember his body that was broken and hung on a cross. And remember his blood that was completely poured out for you. So let's read the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we want to do this morning. So don't take the elements yet. Hold them in your hand. And for the next few few moments, pray over those elements. And Brother RJ is going to come up and he's going to close us in corporate prayer before we take these elements. So spend some time in personal prayer reflecting what Christ has done for you. stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know if thy draw thy breath from me where in this world shall I go. Father, we find ourselves once again here at the threshing floor reminding us of exactly why we're here. He says we're doing this in remembrance of you, Father, but let us not forget the pain and the suffering that you took on so that we could have everlasting life, Father. Father, we weren't worried yet you saw something in this old sinner, in each one of these sinners in here, Father, for you to lay down your life. Father, I know that we've heard that you are a way maker. Father, let us not take that lightly. Because you're working even when we think that you're not working. You're working. And you're working it out for your good. So, Father, I just ask that you continue to be with each and every one that's here. That, Father, when they take on this body and this blood, Father, that may they be renewed in a way that when they leave here this morning, that they're a new person. Father, we're still just so thankful for the young souls that were saved this week during vacation Bible school. That you were able to pour out in them you. Father, that doesn't just happen. Somebody saw enough in them to tell them about you. And Father, I'll be far removed if for some reason, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Father, we ask because this world is so crazy. But we ask that you save them. Father, they need you. They need you now more than ever. So, Father, please be with each and every one that's here under the sound of my voice. May you continue to be first in their life. That at any point in time when they forget their way, if they'll just look up, you're always right there. These are prayers we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. And so today we take the bread and the cup as the Lord has commanded. We do this in remembrance of our Savior, Jesus Christ.
on the night that the Lord instituted this supper, after they took it, he went out and sung a hymn with his disciples. Let's sing together. coming. She's already here. Um, if y'all will, if you'll kind of uh, take re personal ownership and responsibility for your area there, if you will, make sure the trash is picked up. We appreciate that so much and make sure that you dispose of those cups, if you would, please. Um, we are so proud about what happened this week at Bible school. I believe we have five people saved, if I'm not mistaken. And so she'll say something quickly about that. Now, I'm going to give you an assignment, okay? okay? After you're done, you say, you are sent. Oh. All right. I have an yours. announcement too, right, though. We'll Sorry, see. Pastor John. Oh, you got something. Well, you go ahead first, and then we'll let Rebecca do the sending. All right. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Yes. Just uh, a couple of things, real quick. Um, we are having a worship and tech team building social on July the 24th. That is next week um, at 6 p.m. Uh, so if you have not already RSVP for that and you're working in our worship ministry or our tech ministry in any way, uh, we would love for you to RSVP today. So I know that we've had quite a few uh, people that are on the praise team or in the bands that have RSVP'd, but we are missing quite a few of our tech people. So uh, for those are, who are working in tech, um, please make sure you RSVP for that. It is on uh, the, is it on Church Center? Okay, it's on the Church Center app. 
um, where you can actually go on there and uh, sign up for that. Um, and then also our um, students will be leaving tomorrow for camp, and I would just ask that each person in this room please be praying for our students this week. We've got a group of 34 people going on this trip. Uh, looking forward to that and just what God will do in the hearts of the, uh, the teenagers and our leaders this week. And uh, parents, if your kids are going on that, if you're a leader um, that's going on that trip, we're departing from here at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay, 10 a.m. tomorrow. So come a little bit earlier than that. That way we can get the vans loaded up. Um, if you are a youth leader that's going on that trip, make sure you stick around afterwards. We're going to spend some time together uh, just briefing for tomorrow and spend some time in prayer as well. Okay, I'm supposed to be quick, but I wanted to say praise the Lord for Bible school. It is a lot of work, and we are exhausted always afterwards, but it is so worth it, and the five souls that were saved made it completely worthwhile. So I just want to give a shout-out to all almost 70 different volunteers that came and plugged in for three full days in some way before that, helping prep for that. Uh, teens got involved this year. Again, as always, I'm so appreciated that, but the five souls made it so worth it. If you're, and let's give a hand for that again, because that is what it's all about, and that's why we do it completely. Also, we've had some kids saved um, going to Camp Marywood this year. Our kids, they go to Camp Marywood, um, elementary kids, and so that's been exciting, and uh, we'll tell you some more about that later. But today, if your child forgot their uh, craft or any other stuff, or if you would like to have a, another T-shirt, um, go in the checkout center. Make sure you stop by there, and we'll get you hooked up with that. But again, thank you so much, and uh, what a wonderful week it was. And God bless you. You are sent. <laughs>